Well, let's just do it. Let's just start the thing. Today on Rapid Art, I will be talking with Troy Zoller and Dave Nisham. Dave and Troy are both members of the long-running and very popular Rapid City band, Log Jam. Dave started drumming in 1985. His first bands included Anonymous Noise, NHC, and Chicken Shit Log Jam. Since that time, Dave has played with over 20 bands, including the Flagstaff, Arizona-based Tex Watson Swingers Convention. He has also found time along the way to get married, father two children, earn a PhD, and start a new band going by the name of Lawns on Fire. Dave currently lives in Shadron with his family, where he teaches history at Shadron State. Troy Zoller remains a mystery. <laughs> Troy, you didn't send me anything. I didn't. I'm sorry. Well, okay, I put this together. Okay. Uh, okay. Troy is a founding member of the Seminole Rapid City punk band Descent, is a co-owner and manager at Vanway Trophies and Awards. He currently plays in the band American Heavy Metal Weekend and lives with his family in Rapid City, South Dakota. That's and great. You, you still play with Dave and Log Jam too. Right? Yes, as much as we can. You know, it's, yeah, it's hard, it's hard, harder for our bassist to join us than I would say Dave and I are probably a little more uh, available. A little more fancy free. Yeah. Hey, he, who's the who is the bass player now? Paul Dickinson, the same guy. It's always oh, wow. I should have called Paul then. <laughs> See now so you I know what I'm confused about. All right, I thought it was just like, hey, I've got Paul. You know, here's Paul's. I didn't realize that he was playing bass. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, no, that's all right. You know, what's even funnier is when um, we were doing the message thing today. Yeah. There was a Paul that didn't have a picture, and so I was like, oh, Paul's in the in the chat, right? And then, so I called him when I was working on that bio, trying to be factual. And he called me back and I'm like, so I'll see you in a couple hours. And he's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, you know, for that thing. And he's like, no. But <laughs> I sent him the link through um, a text message and I really don't think he's going to be here because he had like a Boy Scout meeting to go to. Okay. Like, maybe. Yeah. Um, so are you yeah. suggesting you padded your bio for Rapid Art? No, not at all. No, is that okay? You no, were trying. Just, no, the, the it, question it was, was when did we start? When was his cousin Doug in town for the summer? And that was 1985. Yeah. I was inclined to say 86. But then Henry, so Henry, we should talk about Henry real quick. Because yeah. he, he's like, he's he's the only bass player that's ever been in the band. He and I have played together since that time, since 85. But, um, We've done other projects outside of this. Importantly, in Rapid, he used to play with this cat named Scott and this trumpet player that we couldn't remember the name of, but they do like jazz things. And this was why Chicken Shit Log Jam was still a band. And then for like the last 10 years, he's been doing bluegrass and what he calls classic folk or his top 40 band. But anyway, so he's really like he's involved with music, but he kind of just like does what he does in Sheridan, Wyoming with the cats that he knows, you know. Man, you guys are making me feel like I need to start a band. Like I've been lazy for the last 20 years. But um, hey, OK, what was it like back in the 80s that made you guys you two want to get into playing music? Was there like a thing that happened like a? Like a yeah. band. Yeah, everything happened in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, like, you know, it was not it was, everybody. Here's a cool song or here's a like a great band or something. And goes like, man, I want to play the drums or I'm going to pick up the guitar or the bass. I mean, what was it like? Was there like one, you know, I mean, sometimes. So, so for, I think for. Like, it's kind of funny. I'm going to be a little bit, um, I don't know, something that scholarly. Uh, geography is really important to Henry and my getting together. And then geography is really important to Log Jam continuing as an institution for the last 20 odd years. Um, so in 
Martin, South Dakota. I had to think for a minute. Martin, Martin. South Dakota. Um, my dad was an Episcopal priest there. That was his first parish out of um, seminary. And Paul had moved there a year before. And both of us came into Martin with a growing love of punk rock. And he had almost given up hope. And then we appeared on the scene, me and my brother, and the three of us created a punk rock scene. We just sort of hung out and we started getting deeper and deeper into it. And it was obvious to us that if you were into punk rock, then you started a band. <laughs> right? Of course. And, and so Doug was his cousin, was Paul's cousin, and he actually played guitar. So duh, he's gonna play guitar. Paul had money and he bought bass and I borrowed the drums from the high school. <laughs> He and, had a snare and a hi hat, as I recall. That was pretty much it, right? Dave? No, no, no. Well, no. At that point, I didn't have anything, right? We were just like, we were just like, well, it's summer. Hey, Tracy, can you get us into the high school? You know. So anyway, and then yeah, at some point we bought. I bought drums, but it was just like, a, yeah, for us in Shatter or not Shatter. I'm so focused where I am in Martin. It was just like, yeah, we're gonna do it. And then also rapid had a thing too right like so descent yeah. was a band social joke was a band k-tech was if there's one thing it's k-tech right mm -hmm. if there's one thing well, about that, we're doing it yeah that's kind of what i was getting at and i mean like uh it seems like there was something i don't know you know i'll be talking to people about you know um like songwriting and like all the creativity that's going on in the hills and then i'll mention something about like the 80s and the whole thing around k-tech and all the the punk rock shows you know what i mean uh, the, sh the house shows the you know to me to me's mill shows the in spearfish <sighs> you know the you did all these shows and nobody knows about it and they kind of uh i ran it you know i ran across the punk rock archive not too long ago and um like the list of band names is is truly, I mean, I think this is a good place to use the word epic, but I mean, it's really remarkable what was going on. And it just seems like just because it happened before the advent of social media, it shouldn't be forgotten. I mean, it's kind of a cool thing that people were creating, you know, yeah, even, even way back in the eighties. Nobody knew we couldn't do it. You know, even, even though we couldn't do it, we didn't, nobody said you can't do this. You're not good enough. So we did it, you know, and, and we all put in the hours and just played and played and played. And here we are. Here I am 34 years later and I still can't play. <laughs> but, you know, but music was accessible. And that's what punk rock did is it made it accessible to us kids. You know, we all like to commune and get together and share uh, our weirdness, I guess. You know, it was a commonality. Um, well, now it's not that weird either. I mean, like 34 no. years later, it's kind of like the way of the world. Well, I mean, it didn't sort take, of. I, I mean, mean, you know, it didn't take a lot to set yourself apart back then. I mean, if you had a little too much hair gel in your hair, people thought you were a freak, right? But anyways, oh, yeah. we just basically just gelled together and music was the one binder that kept it all together, whether it was from K-Tech or just punk rock in general, um, it all kept us going. It well, all the, kept aggression. Don't forget aggression. The Martin thing really threw me though. I guess I did, wasn't aware of that bit of history. Um, I mean- yeah, So we what, really identify, I don't know if, if Henry does, but I really identify with um, the, the, and this is, I'm not saying like, we are as any way in discussion of a band like this, but identify with the Minutemen because they, they have that, that lyric where it's like, we came up from San Pedro, we were effing corn dogs, you know? And I always thought like, we came up from Martin, man, we were, you know, we were effing corn dogs. And we were just like, oh, you know, we, we, we get to, we get to, you know, we get to sleep on the couch and pay rent in a house with the social joke band, you know, this is great. And, um, and so, yeah, it's it's weird. I think it's weird kind of how entrepreneurial in some ways punk rock was. 
um, especially in a place like Rapid where you just found tiny little niches where you could do what you wanted to do, whether it was like the Mother Butler Center or um, mm -hmm. Toomey's Mill, right? Toomey's Mill, what a freak show. I, for, I You know what, honestly, Paul, <laughs> I had not thought about that venue. Schmagley's. In like 20 years. Seriously, like at least 20 years. Toomey's Mill. Dude, did you ever play Toomey's Mill, Troy? No. I don't no, think no. so. Oh, I, was, I was in Colorado then. I was gone. So, yeah. I mean, that was part well, of it. And then, um, well, Descent had a record label as well. Is that was Were you in on that, Troy, or was that after? No. Unfortunately, you know, okay. it's, it's, it's like a mixed bag for me now, you know, 35 years later. Yeah. Um, you know, I left the band during our first tour. Um, things fell apart for me and the bassist, I guess you could oh, say. Uh, for the bassist, he he just stopped getting along with those guys at one point. And I decided that I didn't want to continue on the road without a bassist, so I left. But in retrospect, you know, it was good and bad. It was good because I am where I am today, and I like where I'm at. And if I had remained in that band, I wouldn't have uh, ever played music with Dave and Paul. And for me, at least, playing with those two guys is a lot more fulfilling than, you know, I just can't imagine anything. Um, I can't imagine anything better, to be honest. Not to be a sap, but, you know, that's the truth. Well, like, so like, I want to jump in here and, like, dial it back a little bit, you know. But the thing, so Long Jam, how many tours did we do? Did we do two or three and by tours i mean getting in a van for two weeks and losing yeah. money i did three? two with you guys yeah two yeah. yeah yeah chicken shit did another one that you weren't that you weren't part of but they were always just really really strange adventures in group psychology yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh -huh. and bad situations abounding you know i think that all that's kind of true of practically every band and so, oh. so the funny thing is, like, Logjab always found a way to make it hilarious. <laughs> we had the most fun, swear to God. Well, All yeah, right, so, yeah. like, uh, Descent, you, since you were there at the beginning, though, where did the name come from? I mean, did you guys have to put a lot of thought into this, or was it we like, did. yeah, this, this just sounds cool? We didn't know. Well, yeah, that was part of it, but we, we played, uh, we had a show we were going to do. It was the first punk rock show in Rapid. And we were having a, a benefit show for a, a girl, a high school girl that had cancer, right? So it was, there was basically two bands in Rapid that were in our genre, Social Joke and Descent. And uh, we had to come up with a name because we learned a handful of covers and a few originals. And we thought, well, we better get it together, make it official, you know? And, and we uh, sat around in the living room, and as a group, we threw around a bunch of dumb names and some really awful ones. I'm glad that went to the wayside. And eventually, Descent came up, and it kind of fit the direction we were going. You know, it was a political band. Uh, politics were in the forefront of the the subject of the, the songs and the social issues, and you know, so it kind of fit. It described us in one word, I guess. So, yeah, I, I always thought it was a great name. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like it at first. I thought, what? It doesn't make sense because, I don't know. I just, it, at the time, it didn't completely fit for me. But, you know, that's me, it, the contrarian. And then the band name that, like, I remember, Dave, you told me you, you were really excited about the name of your new band. And you were telling me about it. And I was I was trying to, I remember trying to be supportive, but not quite getting it. Yeah. But now all these years later, it really seems like probably the, one of the greatest band names of all time. But where did chicken shit log jam come from now? Log jam. You guys are just, I mean, you cut it down. Yeah, we cut it down. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pause for one second. Yeah. Door. Gather your thoughts. This is important. <laughs> no, actually I, this is I big. probably will like, cause I think you were even, were you still at Black Hills at this time, Troy? You weren't, were you? I think I just left. I just transferred to Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. All right. Um, or worse. <laughs> so 
I was a history major at Black Hill State University and I was taking courses and I was enrolled in Paul Havela's something US in the 20th century thereabouts kind of course. And I was taking notes about the Munich conference with Neville Chamberlain, right? And I write, Chamberlain was chicken shit. And I'm like, <laughs> and then I just keep taking notes. And I'm like, oh, that word. I really like that chicken shit word. What do we pair that with? You know, and I walk around and I'm 19, 20 something, right? And so I'm walking around trying to figure out what to do with this word. And at this point, I think NHC had broken up and I don't think I had a band, a new band yet. I don't think we had any new band yet. Um, and I decided that the thing to pair that with was log jam right? Chicken shit log jam. It's like these two things that don't go together necessarily. Um, well, this was pre Pearl jam as well. So yeah. Yeah. Scatological, obviously that's a plus. Um, yeah. Pre nineties um, politics as well. <laughs> 2000. <laughs> and, um, and then, so I came up with a whole bunch of different definitions of it and some of them are kind of silly, but the, the idea for the band, I think a little bit was that 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 mis mishmash, if you will, and so it was kind of like Chili Peppers were really big. I was really into um, '60s and '70s R&B and funk, and um, Henry was doing his jazz thing with Scott, and so we were all kind of aligned on this not quite punk rock thing. And then John Liebentritt came in, and I found out since then that some of the stuff may um, have some interesting. Some interesting origins. Ooh, I'm not going to tell stories. I'm going to, um, you know. Anyway, John Barricott, I love you very much. <laughs> so that was John Lee, then John Barricott. See what I did there? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, so we wrote a bunch of stuff, and that was really fun. And we had a couple different singers with that outfit. And the last singer, Mike Weimer prevailed upon us that we should drop the chicken shit. And then in a weird thing that happened, not quite geography, but maybe, we moved from Rapid City, South Dakota to Fort Collins. And Troy joins the band at that point to replace John Liebentritt, who went to hmm. seminary. Seminary. Yeah, to become Let a priest. Let that sink in for a second. <laughs> yeah, right. He didn't end up doing it. Um, he oh, he in. didn't. I always kind of mm -hmm. wondered how that turned out. Yeah, he's 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 one of my favorite dudes, hands down. Nothing. Um, he lives in Phoenix and does like internet stuff. How about mm. that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so we moved to Fort Collins, and Mike split the scene, and Troy joined full force, became the vocalist, and we were not the same band anymore in Log Jam definitely defines what we tried to do whatever the hell that was mm -hmm. basically we tried to take a three minute song and turn it into an eight minute song <laughs> <laughs> and we succeeded and we, and, we, and we yeah we totally succeeded we killed it yeah or we take a five minute song and turn it into a 15 minute song okay yep. <clears throat> So you're kind of like working out some album oriented rock type. Um, I don't, I don't know if anything, I don't know if any of it was deliberate. Yeah, no, it wasn't. So that, yeah, that's rock opera. No, we were just doing the Maybe. best we could with what we had. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to feel each other out at first, you know, and the whole funk jazz thing never really fit with me. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, now it's a little easier, yeah. but now he does. He does pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I can play some funky stuff if I have to. It's just, yeah. So we play some old stuff from the chicken shit era, um, and that stuff for me is a lot of fun because I don't know. I just I like the old stuff. It was a right. it was just a blast. The writing, of course, was good too. But no, it's it was just good. For right. me. It's just Maybe crazy. That's, yeah. But uh, like the funniest thing to me is if just real quick, like having yeah. played with Tex Watson. So that was like a bar band that like would do like three hour sets. So we just played lots and lots and lots of songs. And when we go back and learn these old chicken shit log jam songs, I'm like, what in the 
what were we doing? This arrangement makes zero sense. There is no, no one writes music like this, right? You know, it's like this for three times and then this for two times and then do this once and then go back to that other thing for like three, you know, it's just like, but we didn't like, it wasn't math rock. It was just whatever the hell we were doing. I don't know. Yeah. So what do you guys think was, I mean, what was kind of happening in, in the eighties that, like, I mean, but you know, I mean, I get K Tech was a big part of it, but was there something like just in the air, like all this? I mean, there was more to it than just like weirdness, because I mean, like a big part of like the being in one of these bands or being part of the scene was you you wrote your own music, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, maybe throw in a cover or two, but a big a big thing about it was writing and. I mean, that cre kind of creativity doesn't just, you know, it, I mean, it seems like it's kind of, I always thought it was kind of a special thing, but. What was in the air was the Reagan administration. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was, you know, it was like, it loomed over everything, you know, and being in a political band, at least it, it, it was everything we railed against everything, you know, every fiber of our being was was uh, aligned against that so you know it made sense to write political music everybody they wanted to have we wanted to have our voices heard we thought why should we not be heard and we were you know it's fun we had a reunion a couple of years ago and it's just amazing the response that people um uh, the number of people we had 475 people show up from all over the world yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the other two things I'd say one, you can't underestimate the importance of Ellsworth or overestimate or however you want to do it. Ellsworth Air Force Base in the composition of the Rapid City scene. Um, in that, in that, like you had so you had the MX missiles in your backyard, as the song famously says, but you also had a lot of interactions with Air Force personnel for good and for bad. But Flap is like the classic social joke song, social joke song right? Um, Did they play it at the reunion? The, other, the, other, the second point is like, like creative people are gonna be creative and punk rock exists when things are effed up. Mm -hmm. And so, throughout Rapid City, like State of the Union is by far probably the biggest, like, if you want to think about, I don't know, shared like crowd size or something, the biggest band in Rapid. And they're from, when are they from? Like, two, that, like right Bell. after, huh? Bell, Bell Fouche. No, say, but what time period are they? They're like 90s. The early 90s, after I was in Colorado, they were like yeah. 93 to 94. Yeah. But you this know, thing keeps continuing, I guess is my point, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's really well, weird. You know, one time one thing I think about every once in a while, like with the eighties, and I'd never have anybody my own age really to ask this or talk to. I mean, it's I don't know, this might sound kind of weird, but I mean like the Cold War was still like raging at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I mean you could still turn the news on at night and see graphs of you know, who had more missiles pointed, <laughs> yeah. you know, who, who had the ICBM, you know, like scales were tipping one way or the other, you know, you, you get to hear how many times we could blow, we could completely like destroy life on the planet. And I, I don't know, it seems like that always, uh, I remember that had a, I kind of had a problem with that. I had a lot of anxiety over that. And I, I don't know if anybody else did, but, if any, but it doesn't seem like anybody even remembers it now. Well, they don't. So like it didn't happen or something. And I, sometimes I wonder if it was sort of a, you know, like a fantasy or something like some dark twisted dream. I'm well trip out on this. So I teach this stuff and I actually taught it today. Yeah. Strategic air command is decommissioned, deactivated in 1992. My good people. Right. Right. which is exactly what we're talking about, like State of the Union, you know. Um, so for my students, they have been 92, what is that? Eight years? 92 to 2000, is that eight years? 
right? Yeah. Am yeah. I doing math right? Yeah, thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, you're good. I'm, I'm, you're a history guy, sure. right? Yeah, but okay. sometimes I don't do the math right. So it is like a distant memory, you know, and it didn't happen. <laughs> we didn't know it wasn't going to happen in 1986. In 1986, it seemed like Ronnie Reagan was going to make this thing go down, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it was all part of it, you know? The politics, the music, the radio. You know, radio isn't, isn't as prevalent today. It doesn't have as much of an impact on, mm. on people. It's not nearly as influential as it was to our generation. So, you know, the kids, I kind of feel bad in a way because they missed out on that experience because it just doesn't exist. You know, now they have their own personal playlist on Spotify and, you know, it's so personalized and it's almost meaningless, you know, because you don't have those external influences that drive things, you know, Jello Biafra's playlist. I want to hear it. You know, I want to know what Henry Rollins has on his turntable. Yeah, this is, I would I would be the contrarian here, Troy. And I, by the way, I'm a huge Spotify guy. And the thing yeah. that I would say about it is that it really does make it accessible if you go out and look for it. And a lot of kids, I mean, that's the teenage demo, right? You're looking for new stuff. Um, but the death of radio is really powerful. And the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was, uh, of course, the Crucifix. And the fact <laughs> that there were bands in the late 80s that you put them on and you were like, I don't think they want me to like this very much. You know, the feeders where they have sandpaper <laughs> right on their on the back of their album, so it messes up all the albums you put next to it. <laughs> <laughs> this is total. Yeah, like, that's that's punk great rock. stuff, man. You know, and there's there's kind of a hot topicization of you know, emo is a whole thing. And I remember when Jawbreaker was just a band from the Bay Area or even before that, right? When they were from, from SoCal. But yeah, so anyway, that's why I listen to hip hop. <laughs> well, I think the problem with uh, like something like Spotify or iMusic or whatever is there's so much available. Like I listen to a lot of music, but man, like, yeah. I don't listen to anything enough to like let it sink in. Exactly. I kind of realized that when you like uh, you brought up the um hold steady. You know, and it was like, yeah, I totally knew who they were and I've listened to them, but I listened to them, you know, in a string of like 200 hours of music that didn't repeat. And then I went to iMusic and I listened to all their albums, but like Back in the day, a guy would have bought one or two of their records and then listened to them and got to really know them. You would have listened to A side through the B side in order. Yeah. And you would have got the full experience. People don't do that anymore. And if but there was a song on there that you didn't quite get, you'd listen to it anyway because you paid yeah. like 17 bucks for the CD. Yeah. And after like the 30th time listening yes. to it, you go, oh, yeah, I get it. That's why that's the, you know. Oh. The third song on the second <laughs> second side. Oh, okay. So so real quick here, I want to tell I want to give a plug to Todd Peterson because um he was a, he was the singer for NHC, which was one of the bands that Paul Henry and I were in for a while in Rapid City. And he turned me and Jason Fenner on to the hold steady. He sent us a I think it was a mixed CD. How 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 fun is this? It was a CD. That doesn't that, happen anymore. Does that happen? No, not really. Um, yeah. But it was a homemade CD. It had um, Lifter Puller's album, and then it had Hold Steady's first album. And it was transformative. And then I paid attention to every album until they got boring after, like, you know, the six, because I'm truly punk rock. Right. <laughs> it does happen on occasion. I listened to a comp CD last night, actually, that was oh, really? for, for a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> exactly it was a compilation of 80s music so it was it was pretty good you know but there so are I told some my students today by the way the class of 20 all of them still have cds just really they don't for what it's do. worth. It surprised surprise the hell out of me they do or they don't they do they do 
I have one student who collects DVDs. I think albums are coming back. I have guitar students that tell me about their album collections. Yeah, albums, you know, vinyl sweet or smooth or warm or whatever it is. Okay, so what's uh, like um, American Heavy Metal Weekend? What are they doing these days? What are you, are you recording? Are you writing? Are you performing? <laughs> all the above? No, no. I mean, all these songs have already been recorded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, that's a great question, actually. We're, you know, it's funny because this band started out as, uh, we started out in 01. So we've been together for quite a while. We've had different drummers, and but this hot one. one. Say again, Dave. How do you guys keep Hot bands one. together for so long? You just got to be nice to people. That's Man, all. Is that <laughs> okay? Well, maybe, maybe. I'm sorry. Maybe it's maybe it's something to do with this guy right here. Maybe I don't know. I mean, people have come and gone. You know, we've had a few yeah. people in and out, but uh, for the most part, it's been me and the bassist and two drummers, and and the current one I've had for five years or so, six years. But right now we're just practicing, learning new stuff. We're, that's all we do is covers, Paul. We started out as kind of a, a way to blow off steam after our, our, our real band practice, right? Yeah. So I was in a band called uh, Weapon Has Guilt, and this was what I did after I came back to Rapid. It was two bands later, actually. I forgot about all this stuff. Yeah, you were in 11 Strap. You did all kinds of stuff, Troy. You saw yourself yeah. shorts. Yeah, I mean, even so, the name is kind of a cover, right? American Heavy Metal Weekend? Yeah. Yeah, because what we did was after Weapon Has Guilt practice, uh, we would we would play Circle Jerks covers, and that would, that turned out to be more fun than writing new music at a certain <laughs> point. You know? We learned, you know, two or three songs in about 15 minutes, and it was just like, wow, that was great. Let's do that again. So we kept doing it, and eventually we got bored with the circle jerks and moved into other stuff, and we just started playing punk rock covers from the 80s and 70s, and uh, now we play some kind of new wave stuff and you know, stuff like Firehose and Devo, and you know, we play all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, and then how about Log Jam? Is Log Jam still, are you guys, like, just keeping tight for the next We're reunion? Trying. We're trying, yeah. We are. It's not easy. I mean, I would do it every weekend if I could, but it's just hard to get the three of us together because our schedules can be divergent. Um, it's, you know, Paul has a hard time getting out of Sheridan because he's tied down with his business. And I think it's as simple as that. I don't mean to point fingers or blame, but because it's not like that. But oh yeah, just we have all have responsibilities. You know, we're all yeah, we all got stuff. You know? uh, okay, Dave, what about what about your new projects? Well, we should talk about Log Jam a little bit more. So we have oh okay yeah we have been working on new stuff for a while. Um, we we're trying to be ambitious, and now we've scaled it back a little bit, and just trying to see what kind of happens. We have one. We got Ancient and Vast, Roy, right? So that's a finished song. And then mm -hmm. three or four ideas that kind of float around. And then last time we got together, we kind of tried to test drive another thing. Um, I got, a, I got did, a few riffs in here for next time we see each other. You got what? <laughs> I got some riffs in here. Oh, he's got some riffs. See, that's what we need. Yeah. We heavy duty riffage. So the way we've always worked is I write lyrics and 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 Troy writes riffs or Paul writes a bass line and then we mash it all together, right? Yeah. Um, and then we did a Psychedelic Furs cover, Mr. Jones, which just, oh, it's so much fun. It is fun. It is really fun. And we're talking about recording just to actually get back in the studio. And then we're really, really looking forward to getting our yayas out pretty quick. Maybe we'll go down to Colorado and play a show. Who knows? Yeah. I always want to. I always want to take bands on the road and go on tour with like bands who've never done anything before and show them how easy it is to play rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, that's that's always in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I mean, I I got 
we're, you know, we're just kind of plugging away. Nothing, nothing really hard, but, you know, I'll sit home and I practice and I play a lot of music here at home by myself. And, you know, if I come up with something, I'll record it. And, uh, you know, so now it's coming, becoming more deliberate, you know, because we got stuff piling up that we have to arrange and put together. And that takes time in the woodshed. You know, we have to get together to do that. And, you know, time is hard, especially during a uh, pandemic. Global, global pandemic is the word you're looking for there, Troy. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know what I've, over the last year, I've become an am amateur epidemiologist. So I'm, I'm quick with the COVID facts. <laughs> but for me, it's all the more reason to get together and play music. You know, you got a few people that you can congeal with. And, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is kind of funny. You know, I hadn't thought this way, but if you think about COVID like interrupting two years of our lives, so like what Logjam might have been doing had the bottom of the world not fallen out a year ago and where we are now, um, like I think we were just on the cusp of like doing weekend shows in Colorado and stuff like that. Cause like, it's funny, all the cats that we used to play with now either own bars or, or whatever, right? They're still dialed into the scene. So it'd be very easy for us to do a weekend show once every year, <laughs> six months, something like that. But that didn't happen. And so we'll see what happens next year. Well, it's easier when you reach a point in your life where you become the demographic that everybody's marketing to. So here we are. Well, yeah, now I don't even like, you know, I'm, I'm in a comfortable position in life. I could, I could afford to pay for gas for us and the other band and, you know, the hotel, you know, not everybody's hotel room, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not like, mm -hmm. like we're just doing it for fun now and, and it's possible to continue to do it with you guys. And that's really, that's cool. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. How about yeah, Dave, and you do you have a solo project or anything going on right now? So I I forever I've wanted to do this project called Lawns on Fire because the yeah. great tragedy about um logjam is we don't get together that much because they live way far away. And I I've wanted to get together a, a group of musicians in Shadron and I basically succeeded in doing that and my neighbor plays guitar and the first act I did as his neighbor was I lit his lawn on fire on the 4th of July. <laughs> and it was pretty, pretty epic as you might imagine. It was on the 4th. It was on the 4th. Well, I was either the third or the fourth, but it was right around. It was fireworks. Fireworks were definitely involved. Um, and, and I always thought it would be funny to start a band with him. And then over time, living in the panhandle, people die. And sometimes if you're detached from those deaths, they're kind of vaguely humorous, right? Um, and so slowly this idea of writing songs about death in the panhandle with my neighbor, also one of my first song ideas was my other neighbor across the street, but they've since moved on and the house is in much better state of repair. So we won't write that song anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you, you, I'm killing time in Shadron. I'm thinking about musical projects. You know, things are happening around me. So, Lawns on Fire is now an actual band, I think. And we've written two songs, I think. So, we're going to try and continue to write projects, I guess. So, people die in the panhandle. We try and be reverential with the fact that people pass but also try and tell human stories about life in the panhandle because it's, it's a, it's a space. It's a, it's a, to me, it's a special place. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And these stories would be forgotten otherwise. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, um, I, I, cause I anguish a little bit of it. So I've never had musical success doing anything. Right. I mean, I've had, it's been fun and, and people have liked this. I'm not saying we're totally horrible or anything, but I've never achieved it, achieved any sort of fame. And so it struck me how odd it would be if all of a sudden this lawns on fire thing goes viral and I become famous prophetizing of people's death and suffering. And I did it in this crass manner. And then I'm fucking John Barleycorn and I fucking drink myself to death and jump off the end of an ocean liner at the pinnacle of my success. 
because I'm just racked with guilt, you know? <laughs> so anyway, little Jack London for you. Um, yeah, you need to work this out a little bit more. Yeah, so I, I think before you about the the possibility of this project, even knowing that it's probably more like, you know, this YouTube channel that we're currently doing that no one's ever really going to pay attention to it. <laughs> but it's kind of been fun for me from a release standpoint, being 50 and just kind of hanging out, living life without much point to existence. Yeah. Something freeing about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Although sometimes I cry when I write lyrics. I'm not kidding. Sometimes I cry when I think about it. I just cry. I don't need to be writing. Yeah, I'm tough, Paul. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not Western South Dakota stock. I'm not East River stuff. Yeah. We're... Uh, okay. So this is that punk rock archive that I, has been mentioned, mentioned earlier. So if you want to check it out, if any of this is interesting, this is pretty cool. Lots of bands. There's an HC. There. You know, the funny thing about that is there's, there's, there's some young kids now, some 18, 17 year olds that are, I mean, they, this is like their, I don't know. They look at this stuff and they want to be a part of history, you know, and they're just diving into it and they know everything about everything that ever happened musically in the scene and rapid. And it's kind of interesting to see how, how much of an impact all of this music has made, even on a generation now, you know, it, it continues to influence in a, and I think what is a positive way, it's got to be, you know, it feels positive, but you yeah. know, they're, they're excited about it. They're, they're enthusiastic. It's just, you know, that's how I still feel about that music from that era. It's kind of you know, I'm I'm having a hard time moving on. So, <laughs> I wanna, hold on, hold on, hold on, because I don't want to I don't want to get off on your uh, being stuck in the 1980s for a second. Um, <laughs> the cool thing about punk rock, right? And the weird thing about punk rock is that it is like just this open creative expression, and it's usually political. And sometimes those politics, like 20 years later, you're like, whoa you are not progressive you are actually a really repressive you know you're not fighting for joy and equality and love you're actually kind of like kind of an asshole you know <laughs> but but um no, I agree. um you know the one thing we didn't have in our day was like social media where these things happen you know these disputes and these these uh conversations so it's really interesting just the way punk rock lives on and um, yeah, the politics of it, right? The continuing politics of it. Well, there's more accountability that back then too, because it was all done either, you know, first person face to face or, yeah. you know, you know, it's, so there's, there is a lot, there's a lot more accountability that comes with that interaction. You know, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. But yeah, there are a lot more fist fights, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right though. I mean, people were so I mean, it's still that way. I mean, people are still polarizing and, and oh yeah, oh yeah. A lot of people that we hung around with were so far left that it was it was almost insufferable. But well, that's when you knew you had a big show when the band was so kick ass that everybody came. They put a, they put away all their stuff because it was plug in, you know, um, the dead milkman was like a huge show, right? Everybody yeah. in the scene went to that thing. That's like a way old reference by the way, but, um, yeah. I was there <laughs> trying to think of other shit like, yeah. And then you hear later on, you know, some of my favorite stories after I left the scene was like, Oh, so-and-so got boycotted. You know? <laughs> 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 it's like, Holy shit. <sighs> so funny. They got boycotted. Oh, and so, you know, only 80 people showed up to the show instead of 160 or 250 or whatever, right? Yep. Oh, they were boycotting bands? Well, yeah, because there's, I mean, there's, so, you know, the great thing about the static representation is it's like, oh, well, that's a lot of bands. But, you know, what you don't see yeah. is, you know, X hated Y. And <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe some of them only played a couple shows or whatever. You know, yeah. I, 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 that's fine. That's fine with me. That's still a band. <laughs> I want to know about this Plat Advantage band. I do too. How so did they get on this? Let me tell you my story. Um, 
there were some re extremely talented musicians. East mm -hmm. River, as I recall, there was in high school a pair of pants. It was plaid. Oh man! And the wearer of these pants had special mm -hmm. action with the ladies. I mean, it was just built in. And thus, a band name was born. That I mean, sounds familiar. Is that accurate? Yeah. <laughs> That's the story. Yeah, I see a couple of the members around now and then. The drummer is around, right? Yeah, he plays in like a, a country band, like a trucker rock band. Yeah. He doesn't play drums anymore, oh, no? which is interesting. I don't know. Just Why don't you play well, drums, man? Well, I think it's cool that kids are looking at this because I tell you, I mean, this is kind of cheesy, but man, when I found this, this page, I was almost scared to look to see if, our, you know, if, if we were on there because oh, yeah. I knew that if I, if oh, Plaid yeah. Advantage didn't make it, I would be broken hearted. <laughs> That's interesting. Because, and then to you know, see that we made it. On the... You did. You made it. Because you were like, you were spearfish, right? Let's yeah. be honest here. Geography. Let's get back to geography. You were spearfish. Is um, exclude? Are they on there? Well, Todd grew up in Rap. He graduated from high school in Rapid, though, so he was oh, kind of. So you're the only East River guy. Uh, no, Craig was East River. Oh, Craig Wes was, was East, River. East River. Were you a three piece or a four piece? Oh, we had two different bass players. You're blowing my mind. At the same time? No, no. Oh, oh. no, we had um. No. One that took the place cool. of the other. Can you think of any bands with two bass players? It's hard enough to find one. It is. It is true. The drummers, this seems to be, you know, some bands have an yeah. excessive amount of drummers for some reason. Uh, 38 Special, why? I don't know. I can't imagine... Come on now. No, I, 38 special. So that's interesting. You know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not tripping out on Plaid Advantage as a um, a Rapid City punk rock. I don't deny it. You played Triangle, right? You oh. played with who else did you play? You're going to you get me kicked off the page, man. Huh? Don't <laughs> get me kicked off the page. No, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm this is, this is one of my greatest team. honors. No, it's it's an incredible thing. I I I don't have the same reverential view of this list that you do. I don't think, but um, <laughs> um, you played with what was the name of that damn band? Paisley, Cervex, and I feel like it was it was a K Tech show. I should. Oh say yeah. Oh, the yeah. Electric Love Muffin. Thank you. Electric. It was Love Social Muffin. Joke Us and uh, yeah, the Electric Love Muffin. Is that on here? Is that show on here? I'm not sure. I haven't really dived in that deep, but um. damn, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> Electric Love Muffin and Toomey's Mill. Anyway, hey, so what else is going on? Any final uh, comments or anything? Anything you have to you want to leave the people with? No, I do, I do have a thought, but I'm going to let Troy jump in if he wants. I got nothing, man. Yeah, nothing. I'm, all right. I'm an empty vessel. I mean, <laughs> I you know I I, used, I still have I'm still amazed that you guys are playing together. I mean, in log yeah. jam after all these years, I think it's awesome. I think it's incredible. You, I remember telling these guys at once. It's point, beautiful. Thank you. It was probably 1993 or I don't know somewhere around there, right when we were starting to gear up and record and all that stuff. You know, I told Paul and Dave, I said, they're going to have to kick me out of the band because I'm not leaving. <laughs> but I never imagined it would be 29 years, um, you know, certainly on and off again. But, you know, here yeah. we are still. And uh, I still love playing with these guys. And, and it's just, I don't know. Who would have expected? I mean, these are the things that you just cannot anticipate. You just don't know. And that's the thing when you're making music, like all the dumb shit we did in the 80s, you know, Descent and Social Joke and all those bands. Who would have imagined in a million years that us screwing around in our parents' garages or 
playing basement shows would have left people with that much of an impression, you know, that for some people, I don't know. It, I remember one guy commented on seeing Descent at the reunion. He said, um, I've been listening to these guys since I was 12 years old. They shaped my mental trajectory, yeah. seeing them as a dream come true. It's like, how does this happen? You know, we were just kids screwing around trying to find something to do on weekends to pass the time that was meaningful, you know, because you can only drink so much. Um, and, you know, and being punk rock, you know, nobody told us we couldn't do it. So that was the beauty in it, you know? Yeah, it was. We played a lot of awful music, and it was it was great. <laughs> oh yeah, let's uh, we'll leave it at that then. I guess. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> All right, hey, thanks right. for uh, hanging out, man. This was great. It's great seeing you guys. Good you too. Uh,